Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar organized by Olea Medical Academy and dedicated today to artificial intelligence in a stroke and brain tumor context. So we have the great pleasure to welcome Dr. Marco Essig, who is professor and chair of the radiology department at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg in Canada. And Dr. Essig is conducting research focusing on advanced imaging in neuro-oncology and neuroimaging in general. So today uh, he will give us a lecture about the use of artificial intelligence assisted advanced neuroimaging tools in stroke and brain tumor management. Um, please note that this presentation will last for 20 minutes and you will have the opportunity to send your questions by chat only, questions that will be submitted to Dr. Essig during the last 10 minutes. So Dr. Essig, please, uh, we can now listen to you if you are ready. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, thanks also for the uh, very kind introduction and for the invitation to give this uh, seminar. Uh, so the title, um, as was already mentioned, is the use of um, AI-assisted advanced neuroimaging tools. And I'm specifically focusing today on stroke and uh, brain tumor management. So some disclosures. Uh, I'm from Manitoba, uh, the capital of the polar bears. Um, and I get a speaker honorarium from Olea. Um, to give you a little bit of a background why uh, AI has become such a big topic and why we want to use AI in the future, and that's all about the challenges that we see in diagnostic imaging these days. Uh, and uh, looking from the perspective of a larger clinical department, um, I can report that we do see an increase in the overall diagnostic and interventional radiology workload. Uh, on a year by year basis. Um, but uh, there's the increase and the uh, higher uh, speed and which we uh, operate and uh, do our diagnostics causes more errors and discrepancies uh, because those are often correlated with an increased workload. There's on the other side also a shortage of radiologists and specifically of subspecialized radiologists uh, across the world. And um, beside that, not only the volume goes up, but also the complexity. So we do see a growing use of quantitative and dynamic imaging techniques, which you will see later. Um, there's more requests from our referring physicians for imaging biomarkers in clinical practice and also in clinical studies. Uh, there's at the same time a request for structured reporting and a trend towards personalized disease evaluation and precision medicine and some other trends that makes it more challenging for us uh, to manage our workload. Um, one of the solutions that has been presented over the last couple of years is the introduction or the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms. So if I look at the flow of a patient through an imaging department, uh, we have different steps. So the patient is first scheduled, um, then we protocol the exam. Uh, we try to optimize the protocol um, uh, to get the best image quality. And then there's the largest point, which is the image acquisition itself. And then the radiologist comes on board and does the image interpretation. So we need to detect anomalies. We need to segment. There's something. Um, then we need to measure and find uh, classifications. Um, and then um, we need to report those findings uh, best in a structured report. But we also give uh, recommendations. Uh, we participate in clinical committees and discussions. Um, that's true for image interpretation as well as for interventions. AI can play a role in all of those areas. And uh, we can um, use AI in the scheduling process, in the protocoling, in the image acquisition, but also in the image interpretation. And that's what I would like to talk about today. Looking into uh, emergency radiology workflow, we have stroke and pulmonary embolism 
where we need to make a very fast decision uh, based on the clinical symptoms, based on the imaging findings, and then give a recommendation about the treatment of those patients. Uh, in oncologic imaging, and I will talk about brain tumor specifically, um, we have multiple uh, tasks that we need to fulfill. We need to identify the lesion. We need to characterize the lesion. We need to provide optimized imaging for treatment planning and treatment decision. And then later on, we have to follow up uh, patients uh, after their treatment. But coming back to stroke. Stroke imaging, that's an area which I've been working over the last 25 years uh, with MRI, uh, starting from uh, the time when I was a resident and um, a research fellow uh, up to now. And um, stroke imaging has changed. Uh, at the beginning, um, we had the mandate that time is brain. So do the imaging as fast as possible to decide whether a patient can be treated by a mechanical thrombectomy or not. But this paradigm has shifted over the last couple of years because the timelines for a patient to be able to get a treatment with mechanical thrombectomy has been growing from initially six hours to then now up to 24 hours. And so the paradigm has shifted from time is brain uh, to brain is imaging because these days we need to define based on imaging results whether this patient is still treatable even after 24 hours after onset of symptoms. So the ultimate goal of neuroimaging is to help in the triage process of patients for revascularization with the underlying idea to select candidates based on their individual vascular situation and the physiologic information then that we can get um, uh, with our imaging studies. So it's not only time which is important, it's more and more becoming that imaging is important uh, to make the decision whether a patient is treatable or not. So we can treat the patient with IV fibrinolysis within uh, zero and 4.5 hours, but for that we need to exclude hemorrhage, we need to identify a, an acute lesion, and we need to define the infarct extension. Um, for mechanical thrombectomy in the time range between zero and six hours, um, we need one additional information, and that's whether there is a proximal occlusion or thrombus, uh, which is treatable. Um, the new recommendations um, are that we use multimodal CT or MRI, including perfusion imaging, um, to make those decisions for all of those scenarios. Uh, now, the image window, as I mentioned before, has grown up to 24 hours. And again, to uh, define whether a patient is even after 24 hours treatable, we need to exclude hemorrhage. We need to define the infarct extension. Uh, we need to look for proximal occlusion. And we need to define whether there is a so-called mismatch that we still have treatable uh, tissue, which is called the penumbra, um, which is different from the infarct core, which is already dead tissue. And of course, the collaterals, the identification of collaterals is important in that context. So what do we need AI and automatization for? All these decisions have to be made pretty fast because we don't want to waste uh, time um, to do that decision. And also often that patient that we are looking at is not even in our facility where we do the treatment. The patient is scanned in another facility in a secondary or tertiary uh, stroke center uh, for imaging assessment, and the data need to be analyzed uh, for decision-making whether the patient will be transported into a uh, primary uh, stroke care center where the uh, interventional treatment can be done. So we need automatization and artificial intelligence algorithms to identify and to exclude the hemorrhage. We need to identify and segment and define the size of the stroke using the aspect score. We need to do a vessel analysis to define the occlusion. Um, we need to map the tissue fate, like the mismatch. And with that, we can predict the treatment complications. We can predict long-term outcome. And overall, we can improve the clinical management of those patients. 
on a 24 hour, uh, 365 days a year uh, platform. And this is how it looks for uh, Manitoba. You see here, that's uh, the email that is distributed uh, to the stroke team. So that was just a few days ago. Um, we get the age of the patient for identification, 72 year old uh, patient uh, came with a stroke 25. And that's what is sent by email to the stroke team on a 24 seven basis. And you can identify the areas of mismatch and the area of ischemia. Um, you get also the detailed views, like the uh, perfusion maps, time to uh, peak, mean transit time, uh, blood volume, and blood flow. And those results are normally available in less than five minutes after the patient has been scanned. And uh, the distribution list, as you can see up here, that's the stroke team. It's the interventional um, stroke team. It's the neurologist, the stroke neurologists uh, that are on call. And it's the uh, uh, neuroradiologist who does the uh, primary interpretation. And then these uh, results can help the stroke team to decide whether this is a patient uh, that can be treated, yes or no. So what are the benefits of our AI-assisted stroke solution? Um, it's fast and reliable. Um, it's available anytime during the day. Uh, it's distributed to the stroke team via email. Um, it's available also in secondary and tertiary stroke centers, so um, in centers where there is no neuroradiologist available and where there is no interventional uh, treatment available, but the patient is scanned there because they are locally there, uh, so geographically bound to those centers. Uh, it's very helpful to assess patients in remote locations, and it allows us uh, to meet the 24-hour timeline uh, for most of our patients. Coming to oncologic imaging, as I've mentioned before, the imaging requirements in oncology are getting more and more complex. We have high precision and individualized therapies available, and they require individualized imaging assessments uh, using advanced imaging techniques. Uh, the more precise therapies need quantitative and multi-dimensional imaging for planning. And of course, uh, functional imaging, which we have introduced many years ago already, is a key tool to differentiate uh, tumor-related changes from treatment-related tissue changes. So in brain tumor imaging, we have reached already a fourth dimension. So we, of course, provide three-dimensional imaging data for treatment planning, uh, treatment follow-up, even intraoperative imaging. But now we add a fourth dimension, which is physiologic imaging. So spectroscopy gives us a metabolic fingerprint of the tissue. Uh, we have perfusion to assess the blood flow and blood volume within normal tissue as well as the tumor. We have diffusion-weighted scans, which give us an idea about the um, uh, tissue density, uh, the density of the, um, uh, like the tumor load within the lesion, and it allows us with diffusion tensor imaging to visualize the tracts that are affected by the tumor or are even infiltrated by the tumor. And we have so-called functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, which allows us to identify vulnerable areas in the brain that we would not like to touch during surgery or other therapy. We use those functional imaging tools for differential diagnostic workup, so initial workup of patients uh, or uh, treatment planning, including tumor grading, um, and then treatment decision, biopsy or treatment planning, or even intraoperative imaging. And then we use those tools also for treatment follow-up. The challenge, however, is that we are not scanning uh, on the basis of 100 images anymore. We have up to 10,000 imaging data for each individual patient and time point, and they need to be processed, analyzed, and be integrated into the clinical workflow. And that's, again, uh, where we need help, where we need AI-assisted tools um, to process those data, to make those data available um, on a, a daily basis uh, for decision planning um, and decision making, treatment planning and treatment follow-up. And I would like to give you a couple of examples on how this works. So this is a 20-year-old male with complex partial seizures. Uh, CT was rated negative and then patient came for an MRI assessment. 
And you could see that there is a signal abnormality in the medial temporal lobe here on the left side uh, in that patient. The question, the first question we have to answer, is this a tumor, yes or no? Or is this something different? And so in this case, we apply diffusion imaging uh, using the uh, OLEA AI-assisted uh, processing tool, uh, tumor imaging assessment tool. And we could identify that there is a higher blood volume and blood flow within that tumor area, which is highly suspicious that this is not uh, just a gliotic change, but that there is actually active tumor that is growing here, which was then later confirmed by uh, histology. So here it's a suggestive of a glial tumor with suspected anaplastic transformation, which is based on the assessment of the blood volume, which is higher than normal uh, white matter. So we have uh, the possibility to have those data automatically processed, uh, made available to the clinical team for decision making. Um, and also we have those data available for treatment planning. Here's another patient. It's a 45 year old female. She had a previous resection of a oligoastrocytoma, low grade. And you could see that there is residual tumor or recurrent tumor. Um, again here. Uh, residual uh, tissue changes. And uh, based on the imaging results, including the perfusion information, we could tell that this is a recurrent glial tumor, again, with anaplastic uh, transformation suspected because of the high blood volume, um, as you could see here, uh, which we ob obtained by the um, uh, region of interest analysis. This is another patient, also a patient with an oligodental glioma. The patient had a previous resection and has these T2 hyperintense tissue changes surrounding the resection cavity. There's a little bit of a mass effect, but not so much. But um, the, these areas have grown. So there was some concern from the clinicians that this is a recurrent tumor or recurrent tumor growth. However, the patient had a surgery and multiple um, radio, radiation therapies. And so we did perfusion imaging here as well, also uh, spectroscopy. And you could see that this area is not substantially different from the contralateral normal um, white matter. Um, and also quantification did not show a significant difference. And therefore our conclusion based on the advanced imaging was that here we have predominantly radiation-induced tissue changes. There's, of course, in most of those cases, also residual tumor tissue. But in this case, uh, it was predominantly radiation-induced tissue changes. So we could relax, sit back a little bit, and uh, ask the patient to come back uh, for routine follow-up. So there's no need for a, a surgical intervention or other changes in the therapeutic management. So in conclusion, I think I have shown you that the implementation of um, AI-assisted and automated assessment tools are important in radiology. And they will, over the next years and already, significantly improve the quality, value, and depth of our radiology contribution to patient care and population health. So it will, on the other side, also uh, revolutionize our workflow because we need to integrate those um, information into the clinical workflow. We need to have those results available for our reports, and we need uh, to discuss those reports and rounds and so on. Um, so the question is, of course, will there be replacement of radiologists by AI uh, that's a question which I have been asked multiple times, but I would say a clear no. Uh, we need to use those AI tools. We need to adapt those to those AI tools. And we use it, uh, need to use it as an adjunct to our normal radiology interpretation. So the advanced information synthesis, the combination of those multiple findings, functional or quantitative imaging data, together also with information about patient history, lab results, or clinical data, 
um, can be used in combination with our radiology results. And again, for this, we need uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. So um, the imaging, the automatization of the imaging analysis um, has a high impact on emergency radiology, as I've shown by the stroke um, uh, example, and on our oncologic imaging results with the goal to find the right therapy at the right time for the right person. So we need to be data uh, savvy, of course, uh, but we don't need really a degree of data analytics uh, because we have those tools available uh, that help us in that interpretation. Um, and to summarize, finally, I think radiology is and was already a data-driven specialty. Uh, we are in a unique position to welcome the uh, artificial intelligence revolution and its impact on healthcare. So we need to make use of it uh, for a better workflow um, uh, within our departments and to better manage uh, the uh, increased uh, workload that we have. AI will in the future also provide new opportunities to improve patient care through improvements in imaging and also uh, by the use of additional data uh, that we are currently not using sufficiently. Um, so it will be available via an optimized and quantitative workflow. And we as radiologists have the unique opportunity to become a data expert and data manager and should embrace the new opportunities uh, that those tools uh, give us. So I think in radiology, we are prepared for the future, but we need to take this opportunity uh, to bring our uh, discipline uh, forward and into the uh, 2020s uh, century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Isik, for this uh, very interesting and, and, and clear lecture. Um, so maybe we can now move on to a few questions uh, from the audience. And uh, a first question may be related to the patient. Uh, when artificial intelligence is used, uh, do the patients need a particular information about that? And if yes, how do they react? Well, we don't give a special information uh, to our patients um, for the use of art artificial intelligence tools. Uh, they will be informed that we use advanced imaging techniques and that there will be some post-processing of their data. And uh, most patients don't have any uh, issues uh, with that. Uh, for the automatization and the um, uh, data transfer, of course, we need to make sure that all those um, data are anonymized. Uh, so for example, in the stroke tool, the only thing, uh, patient information that will flow from the scanner to the processing uh, software is actually, um, um, of course, like to the processing software, which is on the server, which is within our uh, network and our firewall. Um, we do have uh, the full information available. Everything that goes out, for example, that email, that goes to the care team or these processed images that go to the neuro-oncology team only have uh, an age identified. All the rest of the um, uh, patient information is de-identified. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, do you believe that um, artificial intelligence has the same future in CT and in MR imaging? Uh, what is the difference between both modalities regarding the applications? Well, we can use uh, these tools in both modalities. So for example, the stroke tool works with CT data. It works also with MRI data, as you have seen. Um, um, there's not really a significant difference. Uh, what we uh, learn right now is that there's so much information in our imaging data that in the past we have only scratched the surface. Uh, there's way more information that we can get out that we are not able to catch with our human eye. Uh, which we really need um, algorithms for. Um, and this information is um, available or there uh, in CT data. It's an ultrasound data. It's an MR data. There's not a real significant difference. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, another question. Uh, from, from your experience, uh, how would you evaluate the interest of radiologists? in artificial intelligence and do you believe that they trust it enough to adopt the tool in emergency situations 
Um, well, um, I think there's um, yeah, like a mixed mixed answer. There's still definitely a large number of radiologists that are kind of a little bit opposed uh, to use those tools because they see it as a threat for their profession so that the computer will take over their role. Um, I'm a little bit different. I'm more open and I think that we need to use the tools appropriately because they will help us with the workload. They will help us with um, the quality. Uh, we can use those tools for quality management. Um, but on the other side, we should not uh, completely trust those tools. These tools need to be evaluated. Uh, they need to be judged. They need to be um, optimized to be used in your own environment where you need to use those. Um, and then we can uh, really uh, appropriately use them. <clears throat> and um, as I said, like I don't see it as a threat. I see it as a chance. Um, but we need to use it um, appropriately uh, and we need to make um, quality checks and all these things to uh, really be sure that we are not um, um, using wrong data that are produced. Like there needs to be quality checks. Um, so it's a slow process, the adaptation of those tools, um, but we, we need to be open to it because um, <clears throat> it's coming, it's coming fast, it's there. It's already integrated in a lot of our work, which we don't see. A lot of the MRI protocols, a lot of the MRI and CT scanners already in the background have AI-assisted algorithms running uh, to improve the image quality, uh, to improve the patient flow. Um, but we need to know what it is. We need to make sure that it's uh, the right thing for our individual situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe a, a last question to follow what you just said. And um, how, how quickly do you think that uh, artificial intelligence will evolve in the next five years? And which new applications would you expect? Mm -hmm. Well, there's um, <clears throat> uh, like, unfortunately, this year there's not an on-site RSNA, but I was very surprised uh, last year at RSNA how much development and um, uh, yeah, how how fast evolving the AI world is. So there was an entire um, um, hall with companies that presented AI tools and AI algorithms and how they can have an impact on um, on on our imaging world. Um, like this is a really very very fast growing area. Um, I see a lot of those uh, tools uh, beneficial for the workflow within the department, starting from the registration or the requisition of the patient, registration, uh, protocoling. You can use tools already for automatically protocoling. The tools might help you uh, in prioritizing. Um, and then uh, the next step would be really um, helping with the image interpretation. And I give you one example. Let's say you come in the morning and there were 100 x-rays done overnight. And uh, you have one radiologist assigned to read those 100 x-rays. Of course, you don't know where to start. Do you start with the oldest or do you start with whatever randomly? Um, but what AI can do, AI can already go through those images and put all those scans that have something that is not normal uh, at, on the top of the list. The likelihood that you pick this few cases that are important that need immediate um uh, immediate follow-up of the imaging findings um, is way higher if you have these kind of tools available. Um, Computer-assisted diagnosis, uh, that's not a new thing that has been uh, around for many, many years. And some of those tools are very impressive and very good. So they can provide um, uh, initial um, interpretation already um, so that the radiologist is more there uh, to do a, a kind of a quality check um, other areas are way too complex, um, cannot be uh, 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 really analysis uh, by um, AI tools so far, but this might come in the future. So for you or for each individual department, I think they need to decide where can we use those tools, uh, look at those tools, assess those tools and see whether they can help you in your IDA workflow or in your um, uh, quality management, uh, interpretation, and so on. It's complex, but it's fast growing and it's uh, very exciting.
Very exciting, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a very, very last question that just arrived. Uh, from your point of view, is artificial intelligence uh, able to, of coping better with ima image artifacts than a human being? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Um, it depends on, like, uh, if you have a very experienced person that has read so many uh, thousands of exams and knows exactly their own scanner and what kind of artifacts that scanner uh, is going to produce, um, like probably the individual is still better than an um, AI tool. On the other side, um, AI tools can identify those artifact patterns uh, pretty good already. Uh, they can be helpful, uh, like of course the final decision has to be made by the human, but uh, they can help you in um, identifying artifacts, that's for sure. Okay, that was the last question. Thank you very much. I think we can now close uh, this uh, webinar. So thank you again, Dr. Isik, for your valuable uh, insight on the topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for the nice questions.